Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Munzer. I'm the Director of Training and Support and Product Management for Triage Software. And I'm here to talk today to talk about what's included in the two-day healthcare training uh, Triage Pro course. Um, it's two, two days. We typically give it three to four times in the United States and then sometimes in London and sometimes in Australia. Uh, without further ado, let's get on to the agenda. So um, what the Triage Pro course teaches you everything you need to know about health, health economic modeling and analysis with Triage Pro. Now, I, I use everything a little bit loosely, uh, but no prior knowledge is needed. You don't need to already know modeling. You don't need to know really much other than what you want to do with it in terms of the diseases that you want to study. And you don't have to know that right away, but eventually you're going to have to know, understand the disease that you're going to model you know, very well so that you can mimic it in the software through through uh, through a model. So you don't need to know anything about Triage Pro or modeling, but you need to have an interest in, in something that you're going to use it for in terms of projects. Um, and we start with models. Um, we, we do a lot of models, but we start with simple decision models, and we do Markov models, and then we finally do patient simulation Markov models, which is as far as we get in terms of complications. And for analyses, we start with the basic cost effectiveness to compare strategies and identify strategies. And we do a lot of uh, sensitivity analyses and eventually microsimulation or patient simulation along with sensitivity analyses, which is as far as we get in the analysis uh, perspective. But you should, at the end of the course, you should get everything you need to start work on your own modeling project. It doesn't mean you can't contact us for a little bit of help along the way, um, but your ba the basic tools you need to get to get going your project should be in place. So we start with an introduction. Um, it's just maybe 15 minutes or so of introduction where we define our goals, which are really to mimic the disease process and treatments as accurately we can in a model and then draw conclusions from what our, for what our optimal strategies are. That's our, our basic goals. Um, and then we talk about how Triage Pro can help. What are the tool, what can the tool of Triage Pro provide you to make that, those goals easier to achieve? And then we spend a little bit of time just navigating through the Triage Pro interface so you know where to look for different things, where to enter data, things like that. Um, because there's a lot of things you need to do to, to create models. And, you know, so the interface is a little bit complicated. So we want to make sure that you're comfortable moving around. Then we get on to the meat of the, of the program. And the, and the first thing is building a cost effectiveness model. So we start with a simple decision tree. It doesn't have a Markov cyclical nature. It's just kind of full patient pathways to, from the beginning to the end. Uh, and we start by building the patient pathways through the model structure, and we visually add events along these pathways to mirror what happens after we apply treatments for this disease out to the end of life, potentially. Um, and so that's the model structure, where, which represents what all the different things that could happen to patients along these pathways. Um, then after that, then we focus on the model inputs or parameters, that, things like costs, probabilities, utilities, all the numeric data you need along with the model structure to evaluate the treatments and choose optimal strategies. And finally, the shortest of those three is to set up the model calculations through the model configuration or, or tree preferences. And, and that's just a pretty simple stuff about, you know, how do you want to calculate this model? Is it a cost effectiveness model? Is it a, just a cost only model? Is it an effectiveness only model? Do you have additional outcomes? So, some different parts of the a model configuration that, that you need to make sure that the model uh, calculates the way you design it to do so. And then finally, we, we do a, a modeling exercise where we try to get you to independently build a model that to, to consolidate all the, everything you've learned in the morning. And that pretty much takes us about to lunch. And I think those there are two long exercises in, in, in the course, and one for decision trees and one for Markov models. And they're really important to, to kind of get you doing it on your own and not just kind of doing it along with me to try to make sure that you, you hold on to those skills. So that's module one. We moved on to module two, and now we have a model that we've built together, and it's ready to go, and, and we spend the next module analyzing that model. So we, the first thing we have to do is, is calculate the average cost effectiveness per patient for each strategy. Now, the software does that for you, but it's important that you understand what the software is doing, at least at a, 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 on a simple tree, so you can have confidence when you do a more complicated tree where it's impossible to kind of do all that math on your own, that you know it's you know what it's doing, why it's doing it, and, and have confidence in those conclusions. So 
once we have the average cost and effectiveness per strategy, then we compare those strategies via cost effectiveness analysis. So we look at how much more we have to pay for certain strategies, how much better or worse our outcomes are, and based on the, on those those average values, we can calculate an ICER or incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which is really how much more we're getting for the amount of money we're paying. Um, and we compare that to willingness to pay, willingness to, pay uh, to determine an optimal strategy. And a second mechanism you can use to identify an optimal strategy is net monetary benefits, where we combine cost effectiveness and willingness to pay into one value, and we just need to see which one's higher. They always result in the same optimal strategy, but it's just a different way of looking at the numbers and combining the numbers to come up with that conclusion. Uh, but again, back to our original goals, we're really about trying to try find the best strategy. That's why we model in the first place. So we need this analysis, these analysis tools to be able to help us do that. Um, and then at the end of that of that um, module, we, we show you how to, to reuse model structures. So if you have a lot of similar areas or similar pathways in the model, you don't have to build the same thing two, three, four times. You can build it once and reuse it to make your model more efficient, the, the model building more efficient and the model more consistent. So that's module two. When we move on to module three, now we've, we, we've achieved our first two goals. We've built the model. We've identified an optimal strategy. But the third goal, and it's, it's really required, is to study the impact of parameter uncertainty. Because there are assumptions in the model about the data, your parameters. And some of those, there, there's some uncertainty around those assumptions. So sensitivity analysis is the study of how that parameter uncertainty may affects your analysis output and potentially affects your conclusions. So we, we start with individual parameter uncertainty, looking at one parameter at a time through one-way, two-way, and tornado. Now, two-way and tornado, they combine two sets of individual parameters, but they're, you're really kind of looking at changing one thing at a time. Um, a tornado diagrams just allows you to see all the parameters you choose, even though they're analyzed one at a time, and see which ones have the biggest impact on your model. So which are the ones that you maybe want to focus on getting, you know, making sure you have good estimates for those parameters. Then we do a, a modeling exercise um, where you build the model on your own. Um, and, and of course, I stay with you to try to help you uh, achieve that and get there. But it's really a critical point, point in the, in the, in the um, overall course to make sure you have time to, to build that model and, and get it running. Um, and then we look at combined uncertainty. And this takes us to the almost to the end of day one. Where, where we're looking at how generalized uncertainty of any number of parameters in combination affects your co confidence in that in the, con the conclusions at your base case. So you may have three or four strategies and you identify the third one as optimal, but as you change a whole bunch of parameters, you may find that only about 60% of the time under the different data scenarios, is number three still the optimal strategy? So you have to report that with your results and say, there's a chance that I haven't come to the right conclusion because not all data scenarios that, that I can consider come up with the same conclusion. And that's an important part of, 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 of uh, publishing results and things like that. Uh, and in order to do that, we need distributions that we pr sample parameter values from those distributions. But this is all just a function of trying to do the probability probabilistic sensitivity analysis. Then we move on to, to, to module four, which is really just the end of day one, where we, we show you a couple of things that are, are kind of useful little tools, but they're not part of the fundamental core materials. A dashboard is just a way to, to take someone else's model and see all the important elements within it. Validation is a way to, to identify uh, an, a number of problems that may be in your model all at once, so you can just go fix them. And Bayes revision is a way to derive uh, probabilities from test sensitivity and specificity in terms of how many positives you'll get and how many of those positives are true positives, et cetera. So that doesn't take very long. Now we move on to day two, and we introduce Markov models. And and I like to make the point here that all the techniques we, we, we learned on day one are still in use within Markov models. You still need model structure. You still need inputs. You still need um, uh, all, all kinds of elements. You still need the analyses you're going to run. But the Markov models allows you to do 
modeling with a longer time horizon to study a progression progressive disease over 20 or 30 years which really you couldn't do with a simple model where you you needed one pathway to cover 20 or 30 years that's not really realistic to do with a markov model you you create a repeating set of structure that you can use for every year or every month and extend that structure out to 20 or 30 years so Markov models is just kind of a, a, an additional modeling paradigm placed on top of the elements that we've already learned. So we spend quite a bit of time, maybe 45 minutes or an hour, really talking about Markov models and making sure everyone understands what they're doing before we start to build them. Then we build a state transition diagram, which is kind of like a bubble diagram that's a simpler representation of a Markov model, but it's good for it's good to use it for understanding the disease flows and talking to physicians about those kinds of things. Uh, to make sure you have it right before you get into the complications of adding a lot of data to a decision tree format. Um, then we do get to the decision tree format of the Markov model. We build this together. And then from there, we evaluate that Markov model. And we don't just look at the, the total end values. We look at the, the, the accumulation of data and the cohort patient flows from the beginning to the end of 30 years. And, and that's a Im very important thing for confidence in the calculations, but also more importantly, confidence that you've created a, a model that actually reflects the disease um, and, and the way it progresses. So if you, when you build that model and you run this analysis, you can see the patients flowing through the model. You can see costs and, and utilities accumulated, and it gives you the opportunity with full transparency to see that the model is or is not accurately reflecting what you know about the disease. And that's a critical part of any modeling project is, is examining the results and and, and making sure that they're reasonable. And then we do another Markov modeling, ex or modeling exercise, but this time it's a Markov model. So we, uh, you independently build a, a fairly simple um, cancer progression model uh, using the Markov framework. Um, and that brings us to module six. And with module six, we, we take what we've learned about the Markov models and we introduce that back into decision analysis by having a decision tree that has a Markov model for each strategy all the calculations that the Markov model needs results in, in a single average cost and effectiveness per strategy, which we then use what we learned on day one, which is the cost effectiveness analysis, to uh, draw a conclusion about what the optimal strategy is. So it's really just kind of bringing the Markov portion back into the decision analysis that we covered on day one. And now you can draw conclusions about optimal, optimal treatment strategies. And then uh, module seven introduces time dependence. So every model up until this point has used fixed values. And fixed values are sometimes sufficient for, for many parameters, but especially probability, but sometimes costs or utilities, uh, but especially probabilities frequently change with time. And so in, in this module, we introduce mechanisms to, as time passes and cycles pass within the overall time horizon, how do you make values change based on the passage of time? And it, it's relatively straightforward, but we, we have to show you how to do it. And we use a table to store a series of values. And then in the, in the Markov model, we take a different value from the table each cycle, and we're able to change a, prob a probability uh, within the model. Um, one other thing in here is time in states. We use a, a, a technique called tunneling to do time dependence, but rather than on total time from the beginning, it could be based more on time in a specific state. So in our example, we, we, we send people to a metastasis state, and then we make the probability of death dependent on how long you've been in the metastasis state under the assumption that it's, a, it's, um, it's attacking your vital organs at this point. So it's, it's a realistic example, and you know, it's an important technique that, that people sometimes use. Now, when we get onto module eight, now we're, we, we, instead of doing what we've done before, which is everything was kind of a homogeneous cohort moving through the model in different kind of fractional elements to get an average uh, cost and effectiveness per patient, now we start actually running simulated patients through the model. Um, and you could do this on any model, but you, you wouldn't unless you, you want to incorporate patient characteristics and or patient history into the model. Um, so, for example, if you have you know, different demographics and, and people in one demographic versus another are affected differently in the model. Well, you have to have characteristics associated with the patient to be able to do that. And if you don't have patients, you can't do that at all. So 
when we once we uh, introduce individuals in the model, those individuals can have characteristics, gender, weight, age, uh, tumor type, whatever it is, and that may affect probabilities, costs, or utilities, or all three in the model. Similarly, if you introduce patients into the model, you can also incorporate patient history to drive those same three elements, probabilities, costs, and utilities. So for example, if you have a patient maybe had a stroke, right? That doesn't just have an immediate impact. That impact could pass on to the future and they could have a lower utility forever or, or for some period of time, um, a, a, a higher cost of treatment. And also probabilities could be worse. You know, probabilities of, of negative events could be worse. So the, the incorporation of patient history allows you to create a more realistic model for more complex situations where if events occur, they can actually have impacts on what happens to that individual in the future, uh, two, four, five years down the line. Um, once we've built the model, then we actually run the individual patients with the model for microsimulation. That generates individual patient histories that are aggregated up into the average value per patient for cost. And then we can use the, co the average cost and effectiveness to do cost effectiveness analysis as we had done several times before and choose an optimal strategy. So this takes quite a while, it takes about an hour and a half or so to, to do this because, you know, it's, it's some new elements. Um, but the good news about patient simulation is you, it's really the same structure of the model. Nothing really looks different from a, a, a Markov cohort model and a simulation model. You just are able to um, incorporate the individual pa pa patient characteristics and patient history that you want, and everything else looks the same. So once we've done the simulation model, then we loop back to the uncertainty, the study of uncertainty, uh, by running both deterministic sensitivity analysis, that's one way, two way, and tornado, actually not two way, one way and tornado, and probabilistic sensitivity analysis um, th with the distribution sampling on top of a patient simulation model. So these techniques are not new, you've already learned them, but we, we use them again in the context of a, of a micro simulation or patient simulation model. And then we, f we close up with the day two extras, and these are really things that are not included in this course because we don't have time in two days, but they are included in an advanced course, which you can either take or not take, uh, discrete event simulation, Markov to Excel conversion, bootstrapping to use real world patient data to inform your patient characteristics, some testing and debugging techniques, patient tracking reports for simulation models. There's a bunch of stuff there um, that we don't really cover. We just kind of mentioned that those are available uh, within the software, even though they didn't fit in the course. And that brings us to the end of the of the presentation. That's all. That's all that's included. But believe me, it feels like a lot after two days. Um, but but I think it's it's a really well conceived course to to try to you know start from the beginning and move you along slowly until by the end you're capable of creating a, a, a patient simulation model with um, with uncertainty studies. And and it's it's rare that you need to go beyond that to to do your um, your modeling work. So anyway, that's all I have for today. So I'm going to stop the recording. Um, thank you for joining me. Um, I have a question. I will take the question. Uh, can the DES models handle multiple events, centers, and patients? Uh, multiple levels. Um, not really. The DES models uh, don't handle kind of multiple entities very well. Um, there are some things you can do almost better with a Markov model uh, in terms of um, using global global trackers to um, to study to study like kind of resource constraints and things like that um, but that hasn't been integrated into the des into the des context so I think um, I think that's it for today so I'll close that Eric if you want to uh, call me with any other questions you can feel free to to reach me after the after the session thank you very much and have a great day